Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our Wednesday night Bible study at Beverly Hills Baptist Church. If you're our guest, we thank you for tuning in this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we're excited to be here. Today is June the 24th, and our study is Bible Doctrine Part 46 in our Doctrine Series, Chapter 5, which is of Soteriology. And Bible Doctrine Part 46 is looking at conversion. Now, what is conversion? If you would like a copy of tonight's study, please feel free to contact me here at the church or personally, and I would love to send you a copy of tonight's study. What is conversion? Now, conversion is a turning from evil to God. God converts the unsaved to the saved, the unregenerate to regeneration. It is produced through the preaching of the gospel and is a result of repentance and creates a new creation. Also through conversion, there are the fruits of the Spirit that are given to each individual as they are converted and through regeneration. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 says that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Each of these gifts are bestowed upon the believer in his conversion. Now, what is conversion more in detail, and what is it that Jesus says about it? Jesus says, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is clear that if a person of this world is to be accepted into the other kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, he must be converted. Put very simple, to be converted is absolutely necessary to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does the word conversion mean? In a biblical sense, conversion means a turning, a spiritual turning away from sin in repentance to Christ in faith. Let me read that again. In a biblical sense, conversion is a turning, a spiritual turning away from sin and turning towards Christ uh, in repentance of sin. It is a dramatic turning away from one's path in order to pursue an entire new one. Uh, it involves turning one's back to the system of the world and its anti-God values. It involves a turning away from dead religion and self-righteousness. It involves a complete pivot and about face in the order to enter through the narrow gate that leads to life. Now, if you recall, some of this language is very similar to that of what we call repentance. Uh, conforming and turning from a one direction to a complete opposite direction or doing a 180. Uh, conversion and repentance run a very same line, and we will see that later on in our study. Conversion also involves the idea of changing direction. A true spiritual conversion radically alters the direction of one's life. It is not a partial change wherein one is able to straddle the fence between two worlds. It is not a superficial turning, a mere rearranging of outward facet of a person's life. Conversion is not a gradual change that occurs over a period like sanctification. Instead, a genuine conversion occurs much deeper within the soul of a person. It is a decisive break uh, with the old patterns of sin of the world and embracing a new life by Christ in faith. It is something that happens to us instantaneously. When we make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and we turn to Him, our conversion is immediate. Uh, regeneration is immediate. Sanctification, the process of becoming Christ-like, is a process, but for conversion, no doubt, is an immediate experience. This spiritual conversion is so profound that it involves many changes in a person. It involves the changing of a mind, which is an intellectual change, a change of view, a new recognition of God, of self, of sin in Christ. It involves a change of affection, which is an emotional change. A change of feeling, a change of sorrow, uh, a sorrow for committing sin against a holy God, uh, a sorrow for committing sin itself. It involves a change of will, which is a volitional change, an intentional turning away from sin and turning to God through Christ to seek forgiveness. The entire person, mind, affections, and will is radically and completely changed in full conversion to Christianity or a conversion to God. And so we see that the entire person is completely changed 
uh, from inside out, from the deepest of the person's soul uh, to their outward expressions through conversion, the entire person is completely changed. Theologically speaking, regeneration and conversion are two sides of the same coin. Now, regeneration is God's sovereign ability by the Holy Spirit in the soul of one who is spiritually dead. Regeneration to life, being brought back to life. We are spiritually dead, and then through being regenerate, we are brought to spiritual life. Regeneration is the implantation of new life in the soul. Regeneration gives a gift of repentance and faith. On one side of the coin, conversion is the response of the one who is regenerated. Now, uh, the esteemed British pastor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, said this, uh, Conversion is the first exercise of the new nature and ceasing from old forms of life and starting a new life. It is the first action of regenerate soul and moving from something to something. Regeneration precedes and produces conversion. So in the order as we have looked at soteriology, we see that regeneration comes before and that we are regenerated. We are made new. And as we are made new, then we are in conversion to facing and seeing a new Christ and seeing Christ in a new life. Uh, regeneration proceeds and produces conversion. There is a cause and effect relationship between the two. Regeneration is the cause and conversion is the effect. Uh, put it another way, regeneration is the root and conversion is the fruit. And so in the believer's life, in the Christian's life, when he has a conversion experience, it is due to the regeneration or the regenerating work of God and the Holy Spirit within his life. It is something that is felt by the individual and something that is shown through the individual through the fruits of the Spirit and through a new life in Christ. Uh, again, the best way to put that is that regeneration is the root and conversion is the fruit. To affirm true conversion implies that there is also false conversion. And yes, we can understand that to be something that is true. Put simply, there is such a thing as a non-saving faith. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the narrow gate. Uh, Matthew records that as Jesus says it in chapter 7, uh, verse 21 of his gospel. People may know the truth and may have felt grief of their sin, but it is a selfish sorrow over what sin has caused them to suffer and not how it has offended a holy and righteous God. And we see that in many times of people who feel sorry for their sins. They feel sorry for what they've done wrong, but not because they've offended God, not because they have truly sought out repentance uh, to a righteous Heavenly Father, but instead, they are sinful and sorrowful for what grief it has caused them. Uh, whether they've made bad decisions in their life and they've went to jail or went to prison, or they're suffering some sort of disease or some sort of issue because of what they've done, because of the way their life is, they're more sorrowful for their situation than offending a righteous God. Uh, uh, people may know the truth and have felt grief of their sin, um, but is a selfish sorrow of what sin has caused them to suffer and not how they've offended God. The most stark example of this false conversion we have in Scripture is that of Judas Iscariot. Uh, in a counterfeit conversion, there is no death to self, no submission to the Lordship of Christ, no taking up a cross, no obedience in fallen Christ, no fruit of repentance, only empty words. They're only empty words, but not a true heartfelt confession. Uh, on the contrary, when a true conversion of sin is aboard, uh, the world renounced, pride crushed, and self-surrendered, faith exercised, Christ seen as precious, and the cross embrace, then one's only saving is hope. Now, I want us to understand this in conclusion. The whole purpose of conversion is to bring men and women into a right relationship with God. This is why Christ came, and this is the reason that why he died. It is God who was in Christ, reconciled himself to the world. Conversion is the crying need of the soul. And until one's life is turned from sin to Christ, 
nothing else matters. Right now in this world, we're looking at all types of chaos. We are looking at uh, riots and protests, fear for the virus, uh, fear for everything that is going on. A question posed to me is what happens and what will we do if in the next six months the world goes into complete chaos? Uh, what happens if there's a complete breakdown of all of society in the United States within the next few months? And well, it is good to be prepared, what I can tell you is that none of that makes a difference. None of that even matters if you do not have saving faith in Jesus Christ. Your life doesn't make any difference if you don't know Jesus Christ. You can do amazing things for the work for the kingdom. Preaching the gospel, but if you don't have a personal relationship with God, it doesn't matter. You can do great humanitarian works, reaching out uh, and taking food to those that are hungry, protesting injustice and, in, and racism. Uh, you can do all these things, but if it's not done for the kingdom of God, if you in your personal life have not made a commitment to Jesus, if you have not had a conversion experience, then nothing else matters. Nothing in this world to come, nothing that you've done, nothing that you will experience makes a difference. But only knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we praise you and we thank you. Father God, we pray uh, today as everything is going on around us, let us not be distracted by the, the needs of this world, the pulling in one direction or pulling in in another, but that we would be wholeheartedly focused on you and that in this life, we dedicate and do everything we do to the honor and the glory of the kingdom of God and that what we need to make sure of right now is of our conversion experience. If anyone is listening and they hear these words and they do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you begin to work mightily in their life. Bring conviction. Bring sorrow, not for the life that they're living or the troubles they're in, but offending you as a holy and righteous God. And that you would move in their life and open their eyes and ears to have the faith and that you would bring them into the gospel, into the fold of your loving, gracious arms. Forgive us, Father, of our sins. Forgive us for where we've sinned against you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you do not have a church family, we would love to have you here at Beverly Hills. We have started our worship services back on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. We're meeting in our Family Life Center. Uh, there's plenty of space, and we would love to have you uh, come and join with us. Until then, be safe, and may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you safe.